Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mayor Iris Smotridge, and I welcome you here to our wonderful Rancho Mirage City Council meeting. Uh, it is the Library Board, Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency. This is a regular meeting, and it is Tuesday, March 10th, 1 p.m. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, call everyone to order, and we're going to start out by Randy uh, leading us in the flag salute, but I would like to ask everyone if you would remain standing afterward for uh, just a moment of silence and remembrance and um, in, in honor of our, formal, our former council member and mayor, Scott Hines, and then afterward I would like to say a few words. So please remain standing. Thank you all so much. You may be seated. And now I would like to just say a few words on behalf of the entire city council because Scott's death was a tremendous shock to most of us and a great loss to those lives that he was able to touch. He was uniquely talented and intuitive in supporting the values of the average man and woman. He genuinely cared for people and used his creativity to improve their quality of life when opportunities arose. If he were here, he would to, if he were here today, he would urge each of us to commit to using our individual talents and skills to help defeat the evilness of depression and despair that poverty, homelessness, neglect, and other circumstances beyond our control beget. Some of Scott's objectives in life were met, others remained. He would hope that we would pick up the reins to help advance the interests of those who need our help, and he would appreciate all our efforts to move these important goals forward. May calm be with you, Scott. And to Scott's family, we know this is a heartbreaking time for you. We wish you all the very best. We wish you well. And we send you our deepest condolences. And we hope that all of your memories of him will be sweet ones and that his work will continue on. Thank you so much. OK. Cindy, would you please call roll? Yes, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Hobart? Here. Council Member Kite? I'm here. Council Member Townsend? Here. Council Member Weil? Here. And Mayor Smotrich? Here. Okay, we have a couple of different presentations we're going to start with. And first of all, we're going to be calling on Gabe Cotting, who is going to make a presentation um, regarding our wonderful. ANA Inspiration Golf Tournament that's coming in just a couple of weeks. And with Gabe is Mike Solange from our Marketing and Tourism Department also. And just to make you both feel very welcome, I would like to just say Ohio Gozaimus. <laughs> and for all those who are not familiar with Japanese, uh, it is good morning. Oh, thank you and welcome. Well, thank Ohio. you, Madam Mayor and, and Council. I am pleased to inform you, Madam Mayor, that your demand of the last two years to have Rancho Mirage, California referenced prominently at the city's signature golf event has been accomplished. And here to share you, with you this new branding program of the ANA Inspiration is Tournament Director Gabe Cotting. Gabe. Thank you, Michael. Uh, esteemed members of the City Council, it's, thank you. Uh, it's good to see you again for the second time today. Yes. Um, we just celebrated our media day, and uh, I, I 
said farewell to our friends from uh, from Japan and New York, so they're on their way to the airport. So they were very pleased with um, with you being able to come out. So thank you very much. So um, one of the important things that was uh, communicated to me was the was the branding for the city. Um, and so what I brought today is a uh, is a proposal of concepts that we've brought. Our team is currently working with your team uh, to vet each of these, but wanted to work, walk through uh, these individually. So on page two of this document outlays kind of what our advertisements look like. So in all newspapers and some of the Japanese magazines, in-flight magazines uh, going through all out, these are our main three players that we're using as ads. Lexi Thompson, our defending champion, Michelle Wee, who's the reigning US Open champion, and then Lydia Ko, the 17-year-old, who's the uh, number one player in the world right now. So as you can see underneath in the blue tail fin, uh, everywhere we mark um, Mission Hills Country Club and then Rancho Mirage, California. So I can confirm that it's in the in-flight magazine in every ANA flight in both Japanese and English. Um, on the next page outlines our plans for outdoors. So billboards have already gone up on the I-10, Beaumont area, and some of the areas for, our, for people driving in from LA, which a lot of them will be. So that's kind of our campaign uh, for billboard, which includes the uh, destination descriptor of Rancho Mirage, California. Uh, the page after that is our plans at the our local airport um, in the main in the main atrium area, and then also in baggage claim and a couple areas there. Use, spread, taking that campaign and spreading that across the different areas. Page after that, all of our sign. This is a signature, um, as you can see in the A and A corporate logo. This tail fin, what they what they call the tail fin, is a signature mark that they're very proud of. So most of our signage will we'll have this kind of mark and use the tail fin. So all of our directional signage uh, on site and also uh, off site um, for road signs and spectators will have the ANA Inspiration logo at the top, the appropriate information in the middle, and then Rancho Mirage, California at the bottom. Going on to the next page, those of you that entered into Mission Hills Country Club today uh, through the Dinah Shore Gate noticed two rather large billboards with uh, up at the top, welcome to Ranch Mirage, California, flanking either side of the Dinah Shore entrance, which is the main spectator entrance and player entrance and sponsor entrance into Mission Hills Country Club. Those were, uh, those were put up yesterday in anticipation of our media day and everybody coming to Mission Hills today. I'll now take you on a tour of the club. So as you enter in the club, you'll see on the right-hand side, um, a lot of our campaign on site will feature one of the ANA airplanes, so people can parallel the, or uh, you know comprehend the ANA is is an actual an airline, and then most of our signage there you'll see the uh, again the the uh, tail fin signage that has the ANA logo along with the um, with Rancho Mirage um, depicted there. We'll have a couple areas for fans to uh, to enter, and so here's a concept of the ANA Inspiration merchandise tent, which will prominently feature Rancho Mirage, California. Next page there, you'll also see the admissions area. What's not depicted in this concept is we're also going to have each year on, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of that concept, there's going to be a little welcoming garden. And so on the, on the left-hand side, there'll be a message from the CEO of ANA welcoming people, a very short message. Um, and on the right-hand side, the current mayor of that year will have a, will have a message and a photo on both sides that will complement the CEO's message from ANA. So that'll be new this year that we're conceptualizing right now with our team. Page after that, um, all of our volunteer hats, it's kind of hard to read on, on, this, uh, on this image, but all the volunteer hats um, on the back um, on the back will read Rancho Mirage, California. So it's something we instituted last year with a lapel pin. This year they'll have it embroidered on the hat and then any women's visors or visors that aren't able to be embroidered will have a Rancho Mirage lapel pin um, attached to it before it's given to one of our 800 volunteers. The next page is a, is a new redesign of, a, of our main leaderboard on the 18th green. We've always had a manual leaderboard and then next to it a a jumbo television that didn't wasn't built into the scoreboard, so it's something I've wanted to do for a long time. So we're actually building one structure. The manual leaderboard will be in the middle. On the left-hand side, as you look at it, will be the, the digital screen. And then on the right-hand side, um, we've actually updated that graphic. It'll be like an arrival board at an airport, and it'll show all the areas in the United States that ANA flies to along with Tokyo. So it'll say Tokyo, Seattle, Tokyo, LA. Uh, it'll showcase, so it'll kind of showcase the, the breadth of, of, of flight options that ANA has. 
and Rancho Mirage, California, although it doesn't look significant under, on this conceptual, it, uh, it's very significant underneath each of the jumbotron and the static image on the right-hand side. And that's the, this will be a large image that everybody in the grandstands and TV, everybody will see constantly. It'll, it'll, it'll be a pretty significant structure. And then the last page is one of the things I'm most excited about. Um, our, the, uh, the traditional um, caddy jumpsuit uh, has always been reserved for just the, um, the sponsor logo and the, um, and the LPJ logo. And you'll see on there, there's a LPGA race to the CME Globe, which is a tour long. It's the FedEx Cup equivalent to the men's tour. So that's considered the LPGA logo. Um, and so no other, um, between, the, uh, between our groups, no other corporate logos were, were to be optioned. When I brought up the significance of the city um, and it being a destination descriptor as opposed to another corporate logo, uh, I was able to get it approved through our group to add Rancho Mirage California on the back underneath the a, a Inspiration logo. So this is something that was specially approved for the city. Um, it commands a much, much higher rate typically than, than what we're extending to the city here. Um, on this side, but I'm very excited to be able to extend that opportunity to the city and think that this will this will carry on through all the global uh, telecasts um, th throughout our event. So um, really, thank you very much for allowing me to present here today. Well, thank you so much, Gabe. Anybody have questions on the council? Question. Richard? Gabe, on that, uh, the uniform for the caddy, rather than putting the name Rancho Mirage in there, could you put the Rancho Mirage logo in? No because all the others are logos on the back of him. Correct, and so, and so the, what we did get permission for was for what was communicated to me is that the Rancho Mirage text, the de destination descriptor of what we're, what we're transitioning to across all the areas on all the, on all the branding you saw, um, the logo would probably require another round of approval if it was to be the logo, but because it's the destination descriptor, much like a Pebble Beach, California, or a Augusta, you know, Augusta, Georgia, um, the text part is, but if it was a desire of the, of the, as of the logo, we could certainly go, go through the approval process and, and see if that was the desire. Oh, we don't want you to start all over again. You know, I know that. <laughs> well, I'm, you're important enough. I'd, I'd be happy. Six. I'd be happy to do it. But we did when we when we sat down the the text the text of Rancho Mirage California as a descriptor destination is much easier to build into everything that we're doing as opposed to another logo. Um, so that's that's what allowed us to kind of extend that across the across the, across everything that we're doing. Okay, Dana. Excuse me. Um, with respect to the uh, back of the caddies uniform, uh, what is the size of that lettering, Ranch Mirage, California? Um, I don't know if I can pick it off 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 the uh, the actual spec here. I can get it. We made it. You know, it's probably the same size as the inspiration in the logo. So I'm. I don't know exactly what it is. Whether it's a, an inch, an inch and a quarter, but it's a significant. Um, you know, it's 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 definitely readable um, versus what's in the logo, like the same text size as the inspiration in the logo. The issue uh, that I was getting at is, uh, I, by the way, I think it's remarkable that uh, uh, I think it was the mayor's suggestion that we have the logo back there, which I think was right on the money, and I think us getting it is extremely important because probably. Uh, television cameras cover more of the backs of caddies than any other single thing during the course of a, um, uh, of a tournament. Yeah. Uh, I just want to make sure that from whatever distance those cameras are, that they'll be able to read what it says on the back of those caddies. And so if you could get some appreciation for that, I'd like to hear that down the road, not today necessarily. Okay, yeah. I will absolutely follow up with uh, with your team and, and the council on this on the size of that and put it into in a better concept for you. Absolutely. And by the way, I don't mean to differ. We can vote on it someday, but I do think that for identification of the city, it's better to have the name spelled out so people know that it's Rancho Mirage, not Palm Springs or somewhere else. And once they do know that, then we can start bringing in maybe the logo, which is a great logo. Uh, but anyway, I'm tickled uh, the way it is right now. Thank you. Yeah. Ted, yeah. Gabe, okay, uh, you know, I want to uh, congratulate you and ANA. It's a great, you know, great achievement, a wonderful sponsor. Uh, 
I've been a member of Mission Hills, as you know, for over 20 years, and I guess Dana has also. And I know the, uh, the hoops that you have to jump through uh, from the standpoint of not only the sponsorship, but the members. Uh, many are very supportive, others grouch about the fact that their course has been taken away for a few days and so forth. So it's very political, and it requires a lot of juggling. But I will say that it's a partnership that has become extremely important to the city. And so we thank you for all your effort, and we're just pleased that uh, Rancho Mirage will continue to have this international brand. So thanks loads for your, for your help. Thank you for saying that. Thank you very much. It means a lot. Thank you. I'll finish up here. All right, we'll, we'll let you go back to work. I know you are a busy guy. And for all those that are concerned, uh, the name Rancho Mirage and the great city of ours is going to be all over the world uh, by way of television and uh, by way of all the advertisement you're doing. So we're just thrilled. Thank you. By, by the way, before you run, uh, the word television rang a bell. Uh, approximately how many hours do they calculate that the Golf Channel will show this uh, tournament um, United States, worldwide, whatever data you might have. Yeah. So we, we're on, by contract, we're on for 22 live hours um, of the tournament and then 14 replay hours. So there's a total of 36 total hours. And then I've actually asked them to calculate the last three years and give an average because I was home on New Year's Eve. I turned on the Golf Channel and our final round of coverage was on New Year's Eve. So there's, there's added bonus um, slots that aren't contracted, but if at, at will, if they feel the programming's right and it's an exciting enough event, which ours certainly qualified last year. Um, and then international, there's a report we publish and, uh, and give to you guys each year. There's 139 <coughs> countries. It's available in about 275 million homes, but there's also a post report that says we were on for 18 hours in Japan. We were on for 20 hours in China. So the bulk of that 22-hour coverage goes is 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 also translated into the international broadcast so they don't just take an hour of it and show it in the major markets most of the markets do a, in anywhere between 10 and all 20 hours of coverage right which and we're one of the only we actually i always like to tout this we actually have more live coverage than the men's masters we also uh are able to show our entire golf course so mission Hills country club is, is filmed from hole one all the way through hole 18 which a typical event would only do the back nine Gabe, I appreciated seeing your pictures of your flight to Tokyo. You look like you had a good time. I had, I had a, a very good time. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, was very, that was very nice. And I can, I can confirm that our ad is in the, uh, I, this is the in-flight magazine, Wingspan, yeah. and so our ad is the second page next to the CEO's message. And then just in case anybody missed it who reads Japanese, who goes from the right to the left, the Japanese version is page two as well. So I, I, I took the flight simply to confirm our, uh, our ad, our ad was completed, so. Good job, they should be proud of you, Gabe, yes. for doing yeah. that. And what a thrill it was this morning at the press conference to hear Lexi Thompson talk about what a thrill it was to play in our city and how she loves being here and the glowing review she gave this. Uh, her favorite this, event. Her favorite yeah. event. Yeah. Doesn't get better than that. That's true, very All true. Right. Thank you again. Well, thank you very much, Madam Mayor and City Council. And so it is at this time that staff recommends that the sponsorship budgeted amount of $200,000 be increased to $225,000. This will accommodate the city's branding opportunity on the back of the caddies jumpsuits that we've just spoken about. This recommendation has been reviewed and endorsed by the Tourism, Marketing, and, sub and uh, Special Events Subcommittee. And so we ask for your approval now. Thank you. Thank you, and I would move that if there are well, no that, other. No, not yet. Let's set item two on consent on the consent calendar. So okay. we'll remember okay. your comments then. Thank yes. Yeah, we came a little bit. Uh, okay. And Excellent. then we'll move forward at that time. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay. Well, moving along to the next uh, presentation, which is going to be done by Erin Sassy. She's the regional, regional public affairs manager, and she's going to be giving us the quarterly legislative update uh, from the Division of the League of California Cities. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I'm happy to be here today on behalf of the League of California Cities to give you an update on what's been happening over the last several months. 
back in November, the league leadership met in Sacramento to set our strategic priorities for this upcoming year. Basically what happens is all of the divisions send their leadership, the policy committees, the statewide league board and our departments, and they decide where we're really gonna focus our efforts lobbying wise. And we have four goals for this year. The first is to expand economic development tools and reduce regulation. Um, our, our, we are working to implement some legislation that was passed last year by the governor, and we're also working to get some legislation that was vetoed last year reintroduced this year that we're supporting just to give cities some additional tools for economic development. Our second strategic goal is to implement additional pension, other post-employment benefits, and related reforms to help reduce unfunded liabilities and insolvency risks. I know this is something that Chris McKenzie, our executive director, has been working on extensively. He works with CalPERS frequently. We've had several presentations from the CalPERS board, including one at the city manager conference that took place in January. Um, and we'll continue those efforts as we move forward. Um, the strategic goal number three was to modernize the financing of critical infrastructure maintenance and construction programs. And this is something that really we're just, our lobbyists are focusing on to get increased revenue for our cities. Um, a lot of transportation and infrastructure needs are present, so we're just trying to get more funding. And then our fourth goal is to update the local government tax structure to respond to the new economy. This one's a little bit challenging. It will take several years to probably implement, but it is something that our taxation and um, revenue committee will be working on extensively in the coming years. The governor also introduced his budget and there are some highlights. I think it was fairly positive for cities. There wasn't too much that was negative. There is a local mandate repayment of $533 million, which is significant, and we're happy to hear that. There's $1 billion allocated by the cap and trade um, dollars. We actually think that that money will be uh, greater, maybe closer to $2 billion, but the governor is pretty frugal in his estimates and wants to make sure that it is something that will, in fact, be there. Um, we're working to get a lot of that money back to our cities. The board at our last board meeting did vote to approve the, the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program that was within the cap-and-trade program. There was money allocated for the water bonds. There was $40 million for city police departments, which also includes contract um, cities as well. That's something that has continued for the last several years um, to help with the public safety realignment costs. So we're happy that that was included in this year's budget. We'd like it to grow, and our police chiefs are working on that, but it's happy that it was included. Um, we're still working on the, the CalPERS and OPEB liability there is about $72 million or billion dollar deficit that we're looking at uh, working to, to clear up. Um, like I said, we are looking at transportation infrastructure deficits, um, definitely something that we're concerned about and we wanna make sure that we have appropriate funding to help with our transportation needs. And then uh, there was a proposal in the budget that we've been working on. It has to do with redevelopment, the solution. Um, there was definitely some concerns that we have and there were some positive components, but basically at this point, the league has an opposed and less amended stance. There was a budget hearing last week that took place. We had about 50 city officials go up to Sacramento and meet with their legislators and testify in the assembly budget subcommittee hearing. And the tone was pretty supportive to cities. Basically, the committee members laid the framework that you know they've been hearing the concerns. This this proposal would be incredibly harmful. Um, it it basically changes the rules of the game already midstream through it. So all of our cities that had redevelopment agencies have been moving forward. The process has been if there was issues they could litigate and basically Department of Finance has decided that uh, they didn't like the way that it was going and so they wanna go back and there's a couple of things that this proposal would do. Um, it would really create a lack of transparency. It would exempt the Department of Finance from the Administrative Procedures Act it would reverse all of the existing laws um, that has to do with litigation expenses and enforceable obligations. So basically, your city would no longer be able to use redevelopment funds to help with litigation costs. Um, and it basically undermines current court cases and future decisions, so it's retroactive. Um, very concerned with this proposal. We're looking for all of our cities to send in letters of opposition. The next step in this is that there's a Senate budget subcommittee hearing on April 9th. Senator Roth, who represents um, some of our cities here in Riverside County, is the chair of that committee. So we're looking to make sure that our voices here, especially in Riverside County, are heard on that. So please get your letters in on that. Um, like I said, there were some workable components of it, but we feel like those could be dealt with separately 
maybe not in a budget process. Um, we think that this would be better policy rather than <coughs> budget related items. There, um, in addition to the budget, our lobbyists are working on several of the areas, and they're broken into really our, our policy committee. So with the Revenue and Taxation Policy Committee, they really are working to get more tools for our cities. There is some, there was some legislation last year that would basically create some new redevelopment tools. The governor did veto it last year, but he said that if we brought it back without it being in redevelopment law, that he would consider it. So that's something we're pursuing with Assemblyman Alejo again. Um, like I said, we had some, some proposals work out last year, so we're working on cleanup of the infrastructure finance tools. Um, for transportation funding, the Board of Equalization did come out and reduce the sales tax, um, the gas tax by six cents, so this was significant for our area. That basically means that 30 cents per gallon um, is now gone from the gas tax. So. Definitely a concern. We're working with the legislature to figure out if there's something we can do to help stabilize this funding source. Uh, we've been also working here locally with the Riverside County Transportation Commission on some messaging. They've created a pretty, pretty, pretty um, good-looking flyer that kind of talks about what this, what this deficit, what this reduction means for us locally. Um, so I definitely encourage you to work with our CTC, work with us, but we definitely need to come up with some sort of sustainable. Uh, funding structure for our transportation needs. There are some pilot programs coming out, the vehicle miles, uh, the road usage charge or VMT pilot program, that will be starting in the next couple of years. Um, there's some weight fee increases, so that would go to maybe a debt service or pay-as-you-go type program. Like I said, we're looking at the cap and trade uh, funding for infrastructure, and there's also some legislation that we're looking at that has to do with weight limits for transit buses. Um, buses that would be over the legal limit could potentially have some fines. Under the Housing and Community and Economic Development, we've had a working group working on vacation rentals and the Airbnb issue. I know that this is something that uh, your, your city has been looking at. I know that they signed on to a letter with a lot of the other cities out here in the Coachella Valley. So that's something that we're still working on. There was one bill that was introduced. It's AB 2020 or sorry, 1220, which would prohibit the authority of local agencies from collecting TOT for short-term rentals, which would be 90 days or less. So that's legislation that we're looking at. Um, our working group will continue to work on the, the Airbnb issue so that you can collect the, the TOT revenues that are due to your city. We're also working to implement our uh, legislation that we supported last year having to do with massage parlors. So AB 1147, we have some question and answer documents up on our website. Um, and like I said, we're just making sure that everybody understands what's needed to get that implemented. Uh, that's under our significant issues page on our on our league website if you need any resources there. We're dealing with CEQA reform again this year. Um, we're looking at some of the sober living and licensed care facilities and ADA reform. Under environmental quality, we're looking at just the drought. How can we conserve our water here? I know that this is critical for us. Um, also, the water bond implementation. The statewide league board did support several components of the bond, so now we just have to figure out where the money's going to go and when and how, so that's something that we're, we're in discussions with. And then, like I said, the cap and trade, which there is the extension of AB 32 um, that we're looking at as well. Um, there is potentially a park bond coming up in this next year. More information will be coming out um, on that just as we get language. So I don't know if that would be for local funding for parks or what. We're not really sure what the language will be yet, but that is something that we're paying attention to. This year, the league is sponsoring another bill on medical marijuana. Just This is really to protect local control for regulating dispensaries. Um, that bill this year is AB 266. It's authored by Assemblyman Cooley, who comes from a city, has been very supportive of cities. Um, the police chiefs are on board again with this, with this bill again as this year as well. So that's something else we're looking for letters on. Um, basically, like I said, it just maintains your local control for regulation. This year, we're also dealing with several public safety issues. Um, I don't know if you saw recently, but the court did strike down the residency restrictions within Jessica's law. So that's something that um, we're, we're looking at. And then just some of the fallout from the, the post-Ferguson uh, era. There's several pieces of legislation relating to body cameras. Our league board uh, did come out um, with a position that we would not be supportive of requiring body cameras on our police, 
our police officers. So um, there's several bills, like I said, on that. We'll be looking at those in the coming weeks as well. And then there's a couple other bills that have to do with the California Voting Rights Act. There were seven bills introduced recently. One of them is um, requiring cities with 100,000 residents or more to go to district elections. And I know that while your city is not quite at that level, um, the concern is that once this legislation were to be passed, that they would then apply it to all cities. So it's definitely something that all cities should be looking at, even though it does start with that 100,000 100, uh, population cap. There is one bill that does uh, affect you. Um, it's AB 277, sorry, AB 278, which would require, um, 277, it would require that the Voting Rights Act d apply to charter city, so um, this is something that they would be amending uh, in the future. So that's definitely something you'd probably want to weigh, weigh in on in the future. We don't have a letter yet, but I think we will in the, in the near future. Uh, basically, what's happening now is all of our lobbyists are reviewing the thousands of bills that were introduced at the last couple of weeks in the legislature, and we'll be setting our positions moving forward. So April 8th and 9th is our next round of policy committees. A lot of these bills will have to go through the policy committee and then to the statewide league board. And then um, for areas that we already have some pre-existing policy, those positions will be coming out soon and we'll be getting out all of our letters um, for support and opposition. So we'll be asking them to you. On April 29th, we have our legislative action day uh, in Sacramento. So I'd like to encourage you to send a representative to come up and join us for that. And then May 11th is our next division meeting, which you are hosting here in Rancho Mirage at Sunny Lands. We're very excited about that, so thank you. And then June 24th through 26th is our mayors and council members executive forum. This is a conference that hasn't happened for several years, but they are bringing it back, but spots are very limited. So if it's something that you want to attend, I would encourage you to get RSVPs in soon. Um, they will be opening it up shortly um, for that, but very, very, very limited uh, spots available. Last night we did have our division meeting. The city of Cala Mesa hosted it, and it was a great turnout. We had about 85 people in attendance. The district attorney was our speaker, and I think overall it was just a really good, really good event. So um, I think things are going really well. Like I said, we'll have positions coming out in the coming months or so on legislation, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Just thank you for having me to give you an, this update. Well, thank you so much. I do have a couple of questions, and I don't know if, if other council members do, but we can kind of take our turns here. You mentioned two things that uh, caught my attention. The TOT collection, mm -hmm. number one, and also the reduction in gas tax. Was there any specific reason given for the reduction in gas taxes? The funds just aren't there anymore. The, this has to do with the you know fuel-efficient vehicles, just the, the revenues just aren't sustainable with the current model. So the Board of Equalization has the authority to readjust it every year and um, came in at the six cent reduction. And for Rancho Mirage, I know I looked up the number, our, our fiscal advisor, Michael Coleman, does an analysis every year. And for you, it's about $383,000. Okay, okay. And then the TOT collection. You mentioned 90 days. And yeah, that bill, it's AB 1220. Um, like I said, that would, let me go back to my notes on that. We'll do the research on that, Mayor, and okay. bring it back. Okay. Yeah, it would prohibit the authority of local agencies from collecting the TOT on that. So, I mean, that was something that our working group and we were concerned about. We didn't really want any statewide legislation on this issue. Unfortunately, we <coughs> thought it might happen, and it, and it has. So we do have a working group, like I said, that is dealing with the issue at large because cities do have the authority to collect that tax. It just hasn't been a very workable process. A lot of the companies haven't really been wanting to work with us. They've done it in a couple of jurisdictions. So we're hoping to get that same precedent that's in those jurisdictions like San Francisco uh, applied everywhere. Um, so that's something that our working group and our policy committee have been actively working on. There was presentations at our last policy committees in January from um, some of the, the different organizations that do this. So uh, that's one of our priorities. We do have a lot of information on our website as well, but that bill is definitely something we'll be watching. Okay, great. And then Randy can keep us updated. Okay. Any other questions, Richard? Aaron, uh, could you just give us the dates of the next uh, uh, conference in San Jose, which will be the, uh, the statewide conference? Yes, that is at the end of September. Let me tell you the exact date. <clears throat> How do you get this in Jose? It is September. 30th through October 2nd, um, it's our annual conference in San Jose. 
Okay, and if any of the uh, council members would like to have specific uh, topics put on that calendar, they can get back to you with any suggestions? Yes, there is a process for that, but yes, please reach out to me on that. Okay, thank you. Erin, the yes. uh, 6%, is that all the cities? Are each city different or what? No, it's 6% across the board, so it, the amount that it would impact each city differs. So like I said, yours is about 383000 And that money goes to? It's for transportation, okay. so that's a hit to your city. Okay, and is there any update on the Salton Sea? Um, last year there were several bills that had to do with trying to get funding. I know that um, there'll probably be some, some bills this year. I don't know if there's any you know, exact numbers at this time, but I can get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah, uh, Aaron, I have a question. Yes. You know, the, and I know that at every conference, the topic comes up about redevelopment funds. Uh, every city, obviously, has been impacted by that. Their plans have changed. You've had to make adjustments. There's lobbying going on to try to get redevelopment funds back on some level. There's also lobbying going on as far as affordable housing is concerned. Mm -hmm. I guess my question is twofold. Number one, uh, on the affordable housing from un unable to read, you still have to jump through a number of hoops in order to get the use of those funds. Mm -hmm. It appears from what I'm reading that it's quite cumbersome and not that easy. I'd like to know what the lobbyists are doing in regard to making that possible because uh, from what I read, there's a lot of cosmetics there as opposed to actual uh, working ability to implement it. You're definitely right. I mean, the legislature has been uh, pretty difficult to work with on a lot of areas. We do have some hope in that front. Um, a lot of the new legislators have come from cities. I think the tone is a lot different now. It's a lot more positive towards cities now, which is very helpful. Um, a lot of them, I think, regret the fact that redevelopment went away and are now trying to correct that. Um, so what that means is they are willing to carry legislation, even if it's something that the governor has been um, vetoing in the past or hasn't been very supportive of in the past. So that's positive. So our lobbyists are working with several legislators. Assemblyman Alejo is one of the biggest champions. Um, uh, the, the speaker, Tony Atkins, she's, something, she's very supportive of redevelopment and just funding tools for cities. She comes from a city, in, you know, from San Diego. Um, so it, like I said, the tone is just incredibly different, which does make it a little bit easier for our lobbyists. Um, it's easier to get things passed through the legislature. We don't necessarily hit a brick wall when we're trying to get some of these bills passed. The problem is, yes, it is complicated. Working with Department of Finance is complicated. Obviously, they have this proposal that's now in front of us that makes it even harder. Changing the rules, you know, midway through the game is, is, is a little bit frustrating and it doesn't help our city. So our stance is, can you please just do things that are helpful to cities? You've already done enough harm. Um, that's the message that our lobbyists are carrying. Dan Carrig, who is over our lobbyists and now our number two under Chris, um, I know meets regularly, with, not only with the leadership in the legislature, but with, with the legislators that are amenable to carrying different pieces of legislation. Um, Senator Roth is one of them since he's the chair of that budget committee hearing. And um, I think the fact that that the hearing we had last week on this redevelopment proposal was really, really positive towards cities. You know, all of the legislators were saying, you know, we've got a stack of letters. Um, we had several legislators come into the hearing just to testify and say that it was impactful to their communities. I think it's just like I said, it's, it's kind of a new era for us. So I think yeah. hopefully we'll be able to see some changes. We have to kill the legislation. That really makes it harder, though. I mean, I think that's the first step, and that's a priority of our lobbyists. And then the second step is the bills that we can get that are helpful, we really need to, to try to encourage the governor to sign, because in the past, he has been vetoing them. And it's, it's not necessarily getting them out of the legislature. It's getting them you know, through the governor. And he seems more open to working with us than he has in the past as well. Thank you. I know it's an ongoing challenge. Definitely is. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Councilmember um, Townsend brought up the issue of the Sultan Sea, and I'm actually working on a letter for another agency about that issue. Um, the State Water Con Resources, State Water Resources Control Board is going to be presented with a petition from the Ir um, Imperial Irrigation District 
that is encouraging all responsible state agencies to get involved with um, restoration of the Salton Sea, um, primarily because of the big hit this, um, the Coachella Valley is going to take with respect to tourism because of the dirty air and, um, and just general unhealthy conditions that are going to be created by it. And so I expect that, that the JPA Executive Committee at the CBB is going to be presented with this letter, and that's a, um, a similar letter should probably be sent by the council. The council wants to encourage the state to get involved, actively involved in putting money forward to clean the Sultan Sea up. Okay. Well, thank you. We will see what happens. Well, thank you thank for you having so me today. Thank you so much, Erin. I appreciate it's it. It's always a pleasure hearing your updates. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next presentation, unfortunately, the one that was going to be done by Michael New of the K-9 Visitors is going to be put off because Michael is not feeling well. So we look forward to having him at a future date. Uh, the next presentation in line will be by Gary Palmer. He's the Managing Director of the Coachella Valley Repertory Theater. Oh, it's a, okay. Now we have Ron Salona who is going to be speaking on his behalf. Welcome, Ron. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members, and staff. First, thank you for including CV Rep in this year's RM Magazine. Your support is much appreciated. CV Rep has experienced tremendous growth in the past three years. Last season, we sold over 4,500 tickets to our plays and special events. Our subscriptions have grown from 420 last season to 700 this season, and we expect to grow to over 1,000 for the 2015-2016 season. At present, CV Rep's Board of Directors has put together a building campaign and committee. They have created a business plan for a permanent 125-seat playhouse. We're seeking donated land and local, from local donors to help us build a freestanding permanent home for CV Rep. To share more about CV Rep's mission, we've produced a short video presentation for you and the public at large. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer the, any of your questions after the video. Again, thank you for this opportunity. CV Rep is really doing something very wonderful and very different People are wonderful and the theater is a gem. I'm thrilled that this wonderful theater is really and truly coming to pass. What's great about it is, is they're all kind of thought provoking, but they're also very intimate. So you feel like you're really part of the production and, and the, the actors are really speaking directly to you. CB Rep is a professional regional theater in the Coachella Valley, which is from Palm Springs to Coachella. And uh, basically, we serve our community by creating thought-provoking theater of substance. One of the things that the audience experiences as soon as they walk into the CB Rep Theater is the intimacy. We have a three-sided thrust stage with a three-sided audience, and our seats are the most comfortable seats here in the Coachella Valley. Between the intimacy and the quality of our sets, uh, they're wowed from the minute they walk in. There is definitely a balance between doing a play that has something to say to your audience that's not just fluff, there's something that has meaning and purpose to the conversation that will extend beyond the walls of the theater. And that's really CV Rep's mission. CV Rep's mission with children as well as adults is that they walk in and through the medium of performing arts, they get to experience a topic that maybe they either didn't know about or they knew about but saw a different perspective on the subject. And as a different perspective, maybe their world expands. And that's what the arts are about. <clears throat> so what is really interesting is there's a lot of theater to choose from in the Valley. And we are a newer company that has progressed very quickly because I guess there's a need for this kind of play here. It's very interesting to hear when the audience <clears throat> leave at the end of shows that they feel like they're getting something they got off Broadway in New York, that they're getting really polished productions, and 
sort of things they don't normally see. They get the musicals and they get the light comedies and the Neil Simon and stuff. But here they seem to be taking, some, taking something away from the show with them. Four years ago, we developed the CV Rep Actors Conservatory. That's important to any rep company. It's important to be an educational institution. And that was from the get-go not only by our children's outreach productions, which we do, but also by teaching children and adults acting classes. We also do something called luminary luncheons, and the luminary luncheons are once a month from October through May, and that's when a celebrity comes out and supports CV Rep by being interviewed by a professional reporter, Don Martin. Basically, CV Rep wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the support of our community both in volunteer work as well as donors. Our donors are everything from a $25 donor to a $25,000 donor. Their money is to basically fulfill the mission and that is my goal and our staff's goal each and every day. <coughs> the arts are about touching people's minds, spirit, soul, and being able to <coughs> walk out and feel like life is a better place to live in. And hopefully we're touching those people. I believe we are because we're growing so quickly that we wouldn't be growing if it wasn't that we weren't affecting people's lives and making the world and, and the Coachella Valley a better place to live in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any hey, Ron, questions from Council? Ronnie, are okay. you looking valley-wide, or were you looking for a new home? We, we and, and specifically myself, who's the founder of the company and live in Rancho Mirage, yeah. want to be in Rancho Mirage That's and stay in Rancho had, Mirage. Right. But our, our, uh, we are looking valley-wide because it's going to take, uh, the, the plan is between 8 and $10 million for the building. And so you know, the donated land is what we're needing. So we're seeking that first. So you're thinking of building brand new? We, we would, uh, the first step is from the ground up. Yeah, we took a, a major theater tour in Los Angeles at companies our size, the small, that have grown into uh, one to 300 seats, that type of uh, growth, and, um, and looked at examples and saw how they did it. And uh, we saw conversions of buildings, and we saw from the ground up. And what we saw mainly was that the, the conversions had problems because yeah. it wasn't built to be a theater. Yeah, so, I was thinking of some, of the old some of the old restaurant buildings that we have. That well, would it, would, it would main, ultimately would wind up being, let's tear out the inners and, and make a shell and then build the, the wall and construction of creating the sound uh, system for a playhouse. I see. You know. Good. Richard? Uh, thank you, Iris. I know that uh, there's been some preliminary discussions with the uh, Cho Coachella Valley or the, the Children's Discovery Museum, uh, yeah. putting a site there, utilizing the parking. Has there anything uh, been going on as far as that? We looking? made a presentation to their executive director, who, uh, as we understand, is leaving the organization. Okay. But she was going to do a presentation to their board of directors, and we have not gotten any reports from our presentation to her okay. and her That's, presentation to their board. Yeah, that could really be positive for not only the yeah. museum, but uh, repertory theater, because the parking is right. there and the available space is there. So it'd be a question of Absolutely. locating the building. Right. Okay. Well, the location was there. I mean, we should, we, they showed us an entire uh, acreage a corner that is not being used that was always on hold for a building to ever, you know, to be erected on eventually. Okay. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And in answer to your question, Charlie. Yes. Um, I did go with uh, Ron and a couple of his board members a couple of years ago. Uh -huh. and we did look at a couple of properties uh, to see if there was a conversion possible. And the ones that we encountered uh, did not seem to be um, as desirable. Uh, because so much work needed to be done on the inside. So right. um, it, it wouldn't have made sense to be a renter in, and to do that kind of conversion. It would make sense to buy the land and, and the, or to, you know, own the building and then gut it and, and create a theater. Right. 
So yeah, we did a little that. investigation. Good. Thank you Thank so you much, again. Ron. We wish you the best. Okay. Moving on again to um, what was going to be our Citizens on Patrol status update, but that's going to be moved to March 19th. And so now we will move on to the introduction of the Traffic Safety Commission, and that's going to be done by Bruce Harry. And while Bruce is walking down there and the gentleman who are going to be um, coming up to be introduced. Maybe they could come forward and line up with Bruce as he comes with the microphone. I'll just tell you a little bit about the Community Traffic Safety Commission. Uh, in 2005, the City Council established the Community Traffic Safety Commission to address community traffic safety concerns and make traffic safety recommendations to the City Council as necessary. The Traffic Safety Commission consists of seven members. It meets on an as-needed basis to review citywide traffic collision data, address community traffic safety-related concerns, review traffic safety recommendations presented by staff, and to make recommendations to the City Council as needed. The ongoing efforts and results of this good commission, good. along with our talented staff, have resulted in a safe driving safe bicycling and safe walking experience for residents and visitors. Our Public Works Director, Bruce Harry, will now introduce our Community Traffic Safety Commissioners. And welcome, everyone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Members of the City Council, staff. Uh, today, I'm uh, pleased to present our seven commissioners on our Traffic Safety Commission. I'll start off with our chairman. Our chairman is Stephen Shuey. Stephen was appointed to the Traffic Safety Commission back in 2006 by former councilman and mayor Alan Seaman. And Stephen was elected chair of the Traffic Safety Commission in 2007, which shows his dedication and passion for keeping the city streets safe. Stephen is a management consultant with personalized property management and manages numerous homeowners associations throughout the valley, including many in Rancho Mirage. Stephen holds designations as a professional community association manager and a certified community association manager. Stephen is a member of the California Association of Community Managers and the Resort Communities Security Association. Stephen served as general manager of the Desert Island Condominium Community from 1992 to 2008 and was employed at Desert Island for 33 years. Stephen wrote a column on HOA Living in the Desert Sun from 2002 through 2009 and hosted a TV show called CAI Report, also known as HOA Today TV, on Time Warner Cable from 2002 to 2007. I used to watch those. Those were very good shows. Okay, our next uh, uh, commissioner is Vice Chairman Robert Buskis. Robert's been a full-time resident of the city of Rancho Mirage for 13 years and was encouraged to become active with the city by former councilman and mayor Gordon Muller and Mayor Pro Tem Dana Hobart. Uh, after nearly nine years of continuous service as a traffic safety uh, commissioner, Robert has shown his dedication to providing safe streets for the citizens of Rancho Mirage. Robert's charitable activities include president of Desert Diabetes Club at Eisenhower Medical Center for the past five years, and teaching English as a second language programs at Palm Desert Library, Mecca Elementary School, and Palm Springs High School. Robert is a retired banking executive, vice president, and manager of data processing operations. Robert loves to travel with his domestic partner of 51 years. Our next commissioner is Mr. Robert Cromlin. <laughs> Robert has been a resident of the city since 1992 and a member of the Traffic Safety Commission since its inception in 2005 and was a member of the city's Traffic Safety Subcommittee founded back in 2002 prior to the formation of the Traffic Safety Commission. Robert is a registered civil and traffic engineer in the state of California since 1955, holds professional engineering registrations in six other states, and is a highly respected professional in the traffic industry. Robert received his bachelor's degree with honors in civil engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. Go Bears. In 1949 and continued on to receive his master's degree in transportation and traffic engineering from UC Berkeley in 1955. Robert is also a 1972 graduate of the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. 
In 2002, Robert was the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Institute of Transportation Engineers for his accomplishments and outstanding service to the transportation engineering profession. And in 2003, elected by the International Board of Directors as the 71st honorary member of the Institute of Transportation Engineers, the Institute's highest recognition of professional achievement. Robert began his engineering career straight out of college in 1945, landing a job with the California Division of Highways, known today as California Department of Transportation or Caltrans, and later went on to work for three Northern California cities. In 1968, Robert made a bold decision to start his own engineering practice, which continues today um, as he operates it in Palm Desert, California. Robert is a retired colonel from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. There is no question that Robert has a passion for traffic engineering and his service as a traffic safety commissioner has been invaluable. Our next commissioner is Cal Custer. Cal and his wife, Faye, have lived in Rancho Mirage for the past 25 years. Cal and Faye have two daughters, four grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren that love to come to Rancho Mirage to visit. Cal has served on the Traffic Safety Commission since its inception in 2005 and served on the former Traffic Safety Subcommittee in 2002. Cal is quoted as saying, quote, this group of highly concerned, interested, and community-minded members are, the, are to be commended for their attention to details, and I am proud to serve with them. Cal holds, holds an honor, Cal holds the honor of being an original member of the Citizens on Patrol Services, as we know as COPS, and as an active community emergency response team member, as well as an emergency preparedness coordinator for his homeowners association. Cal served in the U.S. Army in World War II and returned home with no injuries other than loss of hearing. Were you around artillery? Is that what you... We <laughs> Okay, Cal has a degree in physics from La Salle University and degrees in radio, TV, and engineering from DeVry University. Cal worked for RCA on the East Coast for Information International in LA, and during the second half of his career, he worked at International uh, Information Services in LA. Cal is active with his church and sings in the church choir. However, Cal is not all work. He loves outdoor activities such as fly fishing, hunting, skiing, body surfing, and hiking. Our next commissioner is John Sanborn. John was raised in Palm Springs, and he and his wife, Kathy, have been Rancho Mirage residents for 35 years. John has served on the Traffic Safety Commission since his appointment in 2011. John attended Riverside City College at the, and the University of New Mexico. John has been in the engineering and surveying profession for over 50 years, and I can vouch for that. I see a lot of things that John's done over the years here in Rancho Mirage. John's company provided the engineering for the original Mission Hills Country Club, Desert Island Country Club, the Springs Country Club, Sunrise Country Club, Rancho Las Palmas Country Club, and many other developments in the Valley. John enjoys being a member of the Traffic Safety Commission, and he feels he is giving back to the community that he resides in. Our next commissioner is Don Rocky Smith. Don was appointed to the Traffic Safety Commission in 2014. Don and his wife Jennifer, who celebrated their golden anniversary this year, congratulations moved to Rancho Mirage on, on a full-time basis in 2005. Don is a third-generation Southern Californian. Don and Jennifer have a son and two grandchildren. Don has been a member of the Citizens on Patrol Services program for the past four years. Don loves to play golf, and most likely one of the reasons he chose Rancho Mirage to call home 10 years ago. And our last commissioner is James Jimmy Miller. James is a motor deputy with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department which is under contract to provide Rancho Mirage Police Services. Jimmy has been with the Sheriff's Department for 17 years and has, been with the sh and has been a motor deputy in Rancho Mirage for the past eight years. Jimmy and his wife, Jana, have two children and have been Valley residents since 1990. Jimmy brings a law enforcement perspective to the Traffic Safety Commission that includes years of traffic knowledge, traffic safety experience. Jimmy is a certified accident reconstructionist. During his free time, Jimmy likes to get away to the coast where he enjoys the beach and cooler weather. So this is our 2015 Traffic Safety Commission. Thank you. Well, thank you all so very much. And thank you, Bruce, for the presentation. And I have to say, I've spoken with so many of 
the audience members and the council members in the past who all agree with me that we are so impressed with so many of the credentials and experiences that so many of our uh, commissioners have had. Uh, it is such a pleasure to have you serve with the city and we are so honored that you are willing to do so. And you give of yourself and um, it's just a pleasure. Thank you, thank you again. Any questions or comments from council? Okay, thank you again. And we hope to see you uh, for many years to come in one capacity or another. Thanks. By the way, I forgot to mention, at 3 o'clock today, we have a Traffic Safety Commission meeting in conference okay. room 6. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. All right, moving on uh, to our next presentation. It's going to be done by Sean Smith, and he is our Economic Development Manager and Housing Manager. <coughs> and uh, he's going to be speaking regarding the Housing Capital Improvement Project. Thank you, Sean. Hello and good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Thank you for this opportunity to provide to you some updates on several capital improvement projects occurring at Whispering Waters and Parkview Villas. Those are the two oldest of the four communities owned by the Housing Authority and as such uh, in the most need of improvements. After the elimination of redevelopment, we were authorized to utilize unspent housing bond proceeds for improvements at any of our affordable housing properties. And as a result of the loss of redevelopment, the Housing Authority no longer receives ongoing revenue other than the rents from each of the properties. So it's important that the bond money fund needed improvements now to help mitigate future expenses. A significant amount of work has recently done at Whispering Waters, including repair to the exterior stucco and facade features, repainting, installation of shade elements on each patio, construction of a shade structure at the pool, landscape improvements and installation of handrails, and new AC units for every rental unit. The total cost for this work was approximately $68,000. This photo illustrates the finished exterior repair and repainting for one of the buildings. The property was repainted with similar colors to what was already in place. Now this is a photo taken from one of the patios looking upwards to show the new shade element that was constructed for every one of the patios on the property. And adding these will help shade the patio and also prevent the sun uh, from having direct exposure onto the glass doors leading out to the patios and into the living quarters. Now in this beautiful shot, you can see the shade structure for the pool on the right hand side of the frame. And this provides added protection from the sun, obviously for residents at the pool where there was none prior to that. Um, I apologize for the drop in quality on this picture. Obviously, this one was the one taken from my cell phone, where the ones prior to this were taken by a professional photographer. But in any case, you can see that the, um, the hand, one of the handrails, this is an example of one of the three that were put onto the property and installed and removed the turf where the rock currently is in order to um, pre pre prevent future uh, water being sprayed onto the walkway and pooling where people were walking. And while Parkview Villas and San Jacinto Villas both have 82 residential units, Parkview Villas is about twice the size in terms of land. When the work currently underway is completed, the Housing Authority will have spent nearly $700,000 on capital improvement projects, including the installation of new cabinetry and flooring in the kitchens and bathrooms for 41 units, significant repairs and maintenance to the roofs of the residences, and 47 new air conditioning units. This is a picture of the cabinetry that was replaced in one of the units. We're fairly certain that these were the original cabinets from when the property was originally constructed. Some were in such disrepair that they were falling off the walls. This is just another close-up photo of the cabinetry. And you can see in this slide that in an attempt to keep the cabinet from falling, a wooden dowel was jammed between the countertop and the base of the cabinet. Obviously, this was not a good solution. This slide shows a condition of the bathroom cabinets, and this was typical of many of the units. Here's the installation process underway in one of the units. Each unit takes approximately four days to complete, and in order to accommodate the residents during the work, one vacant unit on the property has been temporarily furnished so that the affected residents can live in it while their units get done. Here's a photo of the completed kitchen sink area, uh, quite an improvement. Here's another completed area in the kitchen opposite from the sink. This is an after photo of the completed bathroom in one of the units. And this is where the wet bar used to be. Each unit had one, and the new configuration allowed for more storage space and is more functional for the residents in limited um, living quarters. 
This is a photo of the staging for the roof work that is currently underway. The roofs of 16 residential buildings are being repaired and improved. You can see in this slide where the roof has been resealed and patched where needed, and this was what occurred on all 16 of the buildings. Another view of the completed patchwork and ceiling around the vents, and one more photo depicting the work. In this particular case, the work seals the areas where water would pool and help prevent it to some degree in the future. We're currently obtaining bids to construct a sidewalk along San Jacinto Drive in front of Parkview Villas. The area is about 450 feet in length, and we would also like to transition this turf into a drought-tolerant landscape as part of the effort. The preceding projects should essentially eliminate the excess housing bond proceeds available. However, staff would like to continue addressing capital needs at Parkview Villas, such as the completion of cabinetry and flooring for the remainder of the units, garage and carport roofing repairs, asphalt maintenance, exterior repair and repainting, and a transition to drought tolerant landscaping throughout the property. Additionally, we would like to install thermal pool heating systems at each of the property as the annual cost for gas at each averages over $10,000. And with that, um, I thank you again for this opportunity and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Sean. Any questions from uh, council or comments? Madam Mayor? Yes, Richard? Uh, Sean, you're uh, talking about a pretty substantial amount of work that needs to be done and most of the funding has already been used. Where would you anticipate us getting additional funding to do this work? In addition to the excess housing bond proceeds, we have excess redevelopment bond proceeds. And while most of that has been spoken for, if not all of it, um, it's assumed that if we can get a project ready to go, that we could move forward so that we utilize those funds. And that is the pool of money that we would recommend it come from. Charlie, can you turn on your microphone? Is there a time limit on those funds if you don't use them? Uh, most of the funds that are being referred to are uh, tax exempt funds. So yes, they do carry a restriction on the use of, uh, as far as the time that they're available to the city. Sean, are you gonna come back to us with a series of recommendations and cost involved? Yes, I, I would get some bids and work through the housing subcommittee and then present that to the board for um, consideration. Okay, great. Okay. The, the work that's been done already is just change those places overnight uh, where a lot of the cabinets were just falling off the wall, as you mentioned. Just a, uh, a huge impact to the, the quality of life for the residents there, very much. That's great, good job. Yeah, excellent job. Very good. Okay, so we can expect you to come back in the next few months or so with yes. some bids? Yes. Okay, thank you. Great work. You know, I can make a comment. Um, Richard and I are on the subcommittee uh, on the affordable housing and have an opportunity to look at these buildings uh, more often than probably than others. The transition has been amazing. And one of the things that we are always faced with as council members, as you can see, they're extremely attractive, is we're asked, how can we get in? How can we rent one of the units? Uh, how can we move up the list? What can you do for us? And for that reason, we contract with an outside agency that handles all of that. We specifically don't want to be involved. Uh, therefore, we don't control uh, how somebody moves up the list. This is done by Hyder Management. They do a very good job, and it takes all of the pressure off of the council and Sean Smith so that we merely refer it to the other agency. But as you can see from the pictures, uh, it, it's, it's an area that any of us would be pleased to live in. Ted, uh, you didn't tell everybody that uh, when those people move out of the units and we're actually putting the work in there, that they either spend their time at your house or my house. <laughs> Absolutely. So we rotate that around. <laughs> Let's be honest. Tell them how much each of you charges those people. <laughs> I would never, never tell. Okay. You know, Ted, that's the number one question that I'm always asked. How do they get on that list? And that was a good answer. I appreciate that. Anyway, good. Well, we're very fortunate that we can provide yeah. that. Yeah. And uh, as you say, a picture is kind of worth a thousand words when you can see the changeover. And we're, we're, we're thrilled. Actually, Sean, you might mention the new brochure that we have available. 
uh, that we show to um, prospective people. Sure. Um, thank you, Ted. So as you can imagine, there's a, a large amount of interest in becoming a resident in our properties. And with staff on site that is part-time in nature, it's very difficult for them to meet with each individual and talk for um, quite a bit of time um, about what we have available. And we field a lot of calls as well. So we thought it'd be important in working through the subcommittee um, as well as our marketing division here at the city came up with a brochure available at the library, City Hall, and then at each of the properties that provides information relative to becoming a resident for each of the properties with yeah. pictures and contact information, some of the requirements, and inclusive of a map on the back as well so that people have a better understanding of what they might be getting into when they want to be put on one of our waiting lists. Good. Good. Thank you. It's a great idea. Yep. Okay. Thanks again, Sean. Okay, I think we're all finished with that. So we'll move on now to non-agenda public comments. And this is an opportunity for the public to speak on issues that are not on the agenda for a maximum of three minutes per speaker. So for all those people that would like to speak, uh, you're welcome to fill out a yellow card. And if you have not had the opportunity, you can always come forward. And we do ask that you keep your comments to three minutes. So anybody? down there that is raising their hand or walking forward. Okay, I see none. So we will close the public comment portion of our meeting and move on to the city com council comments. Uh, anyone have anything to say? Oh, Richard. I do, surprise, okay. surprise. <laughs> well, here's the deal of the day for all of you who have always wanted to take a trip to the Salton Sea this weekend March 14th, the Rancho Mirage Cultural Commission, along with our director, David Bryant, has put together a one in a, one in a million trip for all of you. This will be a teaching tour of the Salton Sea with photographer Bill Brewer, <coughs> who's a local award winner. Participants will leave on a motor coach from Rancho Mirage Public Library at 9 a.m. Saturday, March 14th, and return at 5 p.m. Hopefully, if the, if the coach doesn't get lost in the sea. <laughs> but Bill Brewer will be there to select uh, various locations for the photography. Bill has been a professional photographer since 1982. His assignments have taken him all over the world, and he's a winner of many photo contests and competitions. Bill was named the uh, Epson International Photographer of the Year in 2010. The tour will include a brief lecture of the Salton Sea and a stop at the park's visitor center. The next stop will be at the large folk art installation called Salvation Mountain in Nyland. Now, how many of you have ever been to Nyland? Here's an opportunity. The next stop will be at the Slab City, also in Nyland, and another location along the way will be picked by Bill as we travel along the coast. There are a few seats left in this coach, and if you'd like to sign up for this educational tour, uh, you can contact David Bryant at the Rancho Mirage Library at 760-341-7323. And remember, that's this Saturday at 9 a.m. for an all-day tour of the Salton Sea, and a box lunch will be provided to all of those people who are uh, likely uh, travelers here. So come and join your fellow residents and some of the local library staff for this very exciting mm -hmm. cultural experience. Thank you. And come and join your fellow residents and come and join your mayor and her husband also, because we are going. We're excited about it. I have not been there except to drive by. And it, for the photographer, uh, I know that this is an amazing experience, especially if you're a black and white photo photographer. Uh, as we could see on our screen, um, things show up so beautifully, and it's going to be a treat for everyone. And I know there are two more seats available. I David, hope you've got your tickets. I do. Oh, I okay. do. <laughs> I, we've got our reservations in very early. We didn't want to miss this. But David just confirmed that there are two seats available. So, uh, if first you, come basis. At first come basis. So, if you're in the audience right here, you can run over or give David a call uh, or tap him on the shoulder right here. 
And uh, otherwise, we'll look forward to seeing everybody that uh, is going to be on the tour on, on Saturday. Thank you so much, and thank you, David, for all the work you're doing. Okay. Anyone else on the council? Yes. Oh, Dana. Okay. <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, briefly announce uh, the birth of my um, youngest and last uh, grandchild. <laughs> I think last. Last. <laughs> uh, uh, his name is Curly James Webb, born at UCLA in uh, L.A. Uh, on March 5th. You uh, previously met uh, my, one of my granddaughters, uh, Jackson Webb. This is her brother that she'll have to be able to punch and beat around. And um, I'd like to mention my grand, my, my grand, uh, I can't make that in two words, my daughter, who is grand, uh, Celeste, and her husband, Chris Webb, the proud parents of this little boy who weighed in at 7 pounds and uh, 12 ounces. So. Future lawyer, I assume. Uh -huh. Future lawyer, I assume. <laughs> I would hope so. The world needs more lawyers. <laughs> Dana, based upon his, his uh, birthplace, um, that being UCLA, I assume that he's going to grow up to be a Bruin. Uh, and I'm very, and, and I'm very proud and excited for you. There's I want to congratulate you. There's little chance of that. I want to congratulate you on that Before as well. Before we left the hospital, <laughs> I want you to know I erased all symbols <laughs> of UCLA. I'm sure that he'll go to SC like any other child who has the ability to make a decision. Or has the money. That's a second choice. That's part of the decision. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, this is a tough group. Group, <laughs> terrible. Actually, UCLA is a great hospital, uh, and uh, they have a wonderful neonatal and and uh, acute condition uh, system at UCLA on the Westwood uh, campus, uh, and uh, we got to use some of the various facilities that they had, and I got to say that uh, uh, the care that uh, little uh, Hurley got uh, was absolutely top of the mark. And how fortunate we are that uh, we have them. Any other comments? I'm going to make one brief comment. The, the, in this morning's uh, Desert Sun, Denise Goolsby had a very, I thought, heart-rendering, heartwarming article about Frank Hardison, who's 97 years old. Uh, active golfer, had an accident a year ago, recovering, and is anxious to get back on the golf course. Great story. Very, very uh, touching. Uh, so much so that I invited uh, him to be here today along with Denise, but unfortunately uh, he is having uh, stitches removed from that accident uh, in Orange <coughs> County. I hope that he will join us again and give you an idea of his feistiness, 97 years old. He can hardly wait to get back on the golf course. As it said in the article, he may not play quite as well as he did before, but he's going to be playing. So it, frankly, is an inspiration for all of us. And one other interesting point about that fellow, he's 97 now. Since age 68, he has shot his age in every year. Wow. wow. <clears throat> That was a terrific story. Didn't he give his memorabilia to uh, the country yes, club? Yes, to Sunrise. Yeah, I saw the picture of it. Beautiful. Yeah. Boy, what an inspiration for all of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more council comments? Yeah. Good. No? Okay, everyone is all set. Okay, so I'll close the council comment portion and move on to the minutes. And if there are no corrections or additions to our minutes that move were approval. February 19th at our regular meeting, uh, we have just have Richard has moved approval and Dana has seconded. So please vote. Okay, motion carries 5-0. Okay, now we're going to move on to our counts, consent calendar, which will be handled by Randy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. If, Madam I, if I could, Mayor, uh, may I pull item number two? Right. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> And that is the city sponsorship of the 2015 ANA Inspiration, uh, formerly the Craft Nabisco, as budgeted. Right. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Item number one on your consent calendar is a lease agreement for a city council approved the lease agreement with Desert Images Office Equipment for a term of 17 months starting March 1st, 2015 would be the commencement date and the total rental amount $46,767. Item number two has been pulled. Item number three are two demands. A. Item two is pulled, you said? Isn't there a 2A? There is. There's a 2A. Where's there a 2A? I was at it from Gloria. Yeah, I was gonna add it after demand, oh, but that's fine. Somebody told me it was 2A. So the added, this is your fourth item on consent calendar. And this was added by the uh, SAF subcommittee is recommending a sponsorship, a silver sponsorship for United Way of the Desert in the amount of $5,000 from the special assistance funds. So including that, we recommend approval of your consent calendar. Okay, may I have a motion? Move approval. Okay. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you so much. So now we have number two that we're going to go back to. And uh, Randy? Sure. You so you had a presentation earlier from Michael and Gabe Cotting. Um, this will be a summary of that uh, and some additional information. The city budgeted $200,000 this year for a sponsorship for the ANA Inspiration. The uh, ANA has agreed to a five-year commitment to be the title sponsor for the signature event in the city of Rancho Mirage. IMG will continue to be the management company. Some of the highlights and benefits to the city of Rancho Mirage, 15 30-second spots, I'm look, reading on page 2-2, to yes. air Thursday through Sunday on the Gulf Channel. Telecast signage to feature Rancho Mirage, California, heart of the Palm Springs Valley. On-air personalities to state the telecast originates in Rancho Mirage. Mayor's welcome is included and Mayor's presence on the 18th green. ANA will also provide dedicated on-site brand campaign to include the city of Rancho Mirage and many other things related to the city of Rancho Mirage. Uh, destination description printed on the back of the tickets, full page color ad in the commemorative uh, official program. Daily Pairings Guide, Rancho Mirage uh, highlighted on the ANA, ANA website. And then there's also a uh, list of entertainment and hospitality items that are included and some additional benefits on page 2-4. The SAF subcommittee met with staff uh, earlier this week, actually I think last Friday, and asked for an additional $25,000 and that was described as being uh, to sponsor the um, City of Rancho Mirage, California on the backs of the bibs of the um, caddies. So the total amount would be $225,000. Okay, any questions? I would just add that uh, one of the primary reasons that uh, we have added the additional $25,000 to have the name Rancho Mirage, California on the back of uh, the uniforms worn by the caddies is one that's a one-time payment that will uh, carry on in future years without an additional expense. But secondly, anybody that watches the tournament knows that the thing you see more than anything else is the back of caddies. They're pointing one way or another, they're giving directions, they're helping line up putts, they're doing all sorts of things. And the backs usually have some type of uh, writing on them. And uh, we thought it would be a good idea to have Ranch Mirage California there to give us that additional bump in publicity. And for people who may wonder why we devote uh, a sum, a total of $225,000 uh, to this tournament, uh, I would point generally to the fact that in 1973, when Rancho Mirage was first incorporated, it was incorporated as a sales tax, bed tax uh, based city as compared to a property tax based city. It was the determination by the founders at that time that if uh, we had tried to charge property taxes to the uh, residents, for the administration of the government, that it would probably fail. And consequently, they decided to go the other way. Well, <clears throat> with hotels being so important to our city, uh, particularly resort hotels and business hotels, 
uh, it's important that the name Rancho Mirage uh, be seen. Uh, in the early days of this tournament, it was advertised as Southern California. Uh, we complained along the way, and they eventually started calling it Palm Springs. Uh, and we have been fighting them now, and we've been pretty successful the last few years to make sure that nobody called us Palm Springs during the course of that tournament. So by adding this little bit on the back of the uniforms of the caddies, uh, we think mm -hmm. we're making just a little bit more headway into notifying the traveling world, the visiting world, that comes someplace to play golf, that we are in Rancho Mirage, California. And so I would recommend that we approve the uh, $225,000 budget, Madam Mayor. And I would second that. Any other discussion? Dana, is the $25,000 the actual cost of uh, putting the name on these various uh, uniforms? I don't, I don't know, because it changes from year to year. Uh, I, I would think, although they may hang on to the, some of the uniforms, but I suspect it changes from year to year. And uh, that's just the negotiated price that we arrived with, uh, ANA, Inspiration, uh, for, these, um, uh, for this amenity on the backs of those uniforms. So next year, will the, the amount will be 200000 without the twenty five. Next year, whatever the amount is we decide to contribute to the to the tournament, uh, it will not. There won't be an additional amount for the uniforms. Okay. This is an ongoing, continued payment, one-time payment. Okay. Is there enough time for them to make that change about the logo, or have they already printed these? There is. Well, it's not going to be a logo on the back. It's going to be the name. Well, I thought Richard said that we looked. Well, he for talked it. about that. But yeah. if you had the logo, nobody'd be able to read it. I see. If you knew the logo, you'd say, "Oh, great! I think that's Ransom Mirage." I got it. We don't want people around the world not knowing that, it's, that this tournament is in Ransom Mirage, California. I got you. And for that reason, those words are spelled out. Good. Okay. And for the, all those interested, we are known as the part of the. Uh, Palm, Ran Springs. Palm Springs Valley. Yeah. Uh, Rancho Mirage, well, we heart are. of the Palm Springs Valley. And if you see some of our okay, advertisement, we always have a heart shape there. And Where's Robert uh, Barrett? Is he not in here? No, nope. Mike Solange is here. Yeah. Uh, but I think that um, we're just proud of what they're doing. We're thrilled with the progress that's been made. And uh, we're moving forward just beautifully. And yeah. we're delighted. Yes. Okay. Any other public comments uh, in from the audience? Seeing none, we'll close public comment portion. Oh, we do have a comment. Would you like to come forward? You have a motion. Okay. Okay. Excuse me. Be, before, while it, rather than standing, sitting back there and talking, we do have a motion and we do have a second. So um, maybe we can go back and and um, we'll just allow you to come forward and say. Uh, whatever you'd like, uh, and keep it to three minutes, please. I was just inquiring to the gentleman for the salt and sea. Uh, can you speak into it's the microphone? It's David Giacomuzzi, and yes. you mentioned that the gentleman is here, the, that is um, the photographer that is going to the event for the salt and sea. Oh, you're talking about our executive yeah. director of the library with it regarding yes, our salt Yes, because I event. signed up, so I'll be going with you. Okay, well, <laughs> as that a photographer great. and journalist, okay. and not only uh, but, environmentalist. You know, rather than you, you know, uh, perhaps since we have a motion and a second on the floor, why don't we go ahead and go ahead and vote on that, and then perhaps you can talk to David Bryant uh, if you have any questions, and we'll I'll look for you. Well, I'm on looking the tour. for a ticket. You're looking for a ticket. He's the one to talk to. He's, he's the ticket man. Over he's there. right over there Thank in you, the Mayor. jacket Thank with you, the gold tally. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second, so why don't we go ahead and vote? Is that a great response on our advertising the tickets? Absolutely. And we're selling them right yes, here. We're selling them right out. here. We have one ticket left, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but that was without the logo on the back. I wonder if we should reconsider, because there was a sale. Uh, we might have saved the money. All right, never mind. Let's go ahead and do it. <laughs> so that's your it's, 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 okay. <laughs> it's good to have senses of humor up here. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, we have uh, voted and it, motion carries 5-0. Thank you so much. And okay. thank, thank you, Madam Mayor, to the uh, Tourism Subcommittee consisting of uh, Mayor Smotridge and Mayor Pro Tem Hobart. Thank you. You are so welcome. Okay, now we are going to be moving on to a, our urgency uh, part of the uh, consent calendar. Well, so, no, we finished okay, I consent. thought we did that already. Okay, we did that. You want to hear it again? Did we vote we'll on just it? Yeah. As we, part of consent. Okay. Yes, we, we did vote on that. On. Okay, but if you'd like to know any more details, we can. We voted on everything except the one item we pulled, which it was the last pulled. item. Right, right, and that we just voted on. Okay. Yeah. Good exactly. Good okay, I good. know it goes by so fast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy good. for you to say. <laughs> I know. It flies when you're having fun. <laughs> I know. Well, we are having fun. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. <laughs> okay, uh, now we're going to move on to our action item. And this is uh, going to be handled by our finance director, Isaiah Hagerman. And uh, you can fill us in on the details of this. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, the item before you today is the full redemption of the 2005A lease revenue bonds. The uh, Budget Subcommittee, which consists of Mayor Pro Tem Hobart and Councilman Kite, uh, reviewed the fiscal prudence of utilizing general fund reserves to pay off the last remained, remaining bonded obligation of the city. Currently, the uh, city only has one bond outstanding, and it's the 2005A lease revenue bonds. And the uh, pertinent facts that we reviewed is um, currently we budget 392000 a year to pay for the debt service payments for this debt. Um, as of April 1st, 2015, there will be 4215000 outstanding in principal. And the interest on this debt ranges from 4.125% to 4.5% as you extend later in the maturities. While our portfolio is currently earning approximately 1.15%. If we were to continue to follow the debt service schedule and pay the remaining debt service out to maturity, uh, the city would pay uh, approximately 5.8 million. By utilizing our reserves and redeeming the bonds as of April 1st, we will save approximately 1.6 in interest. 1.6 million in interest, thank you. Um, so the recommendation here is to utilize 3.6 million in general fund reserves to retire the last remaining bonded obligation. And we feel like this will reduce future operating costs and better position the city financially. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Just a, a comment from the subcommittee. Uh, by paying this off and by paying off the unfunded pension liability, we have essentially debt free now. And I think there are probably not very many cities out there that can say that their pension liability is zero and that they have zero outstanding on long term debt. So, congratulations to Isaiah putting together this package uh, and the previous package. And we've done a great job in not only saving us money, but making us more sound in the long run. Thank you. Uh, Richard, I might say that the uniqueness of what we're doing here as a city uh, is not solely limited to California. I think you can make that statement for cities throughout the country. There are very few that have no zero unfunded pension liability or bonded indebtedness. I think that makes Rancho Mirage a very unique city. Any other comments? Okay. Well, I, you are absolutely right. And uh, although we sometimes do get a little humorous up here, we take government very seriously and we take our fiscal responsibility very seriously. So we are enjoying great pride in uh, the fact that we can do that. I thank you all and I thank you, Isaiah, for all the work you've done on this. And Dana and Ted. So would somebody like to make a motion? I'd like to move that the uh, City Council authorize the City Manager 
to execute the payment for the full redemption of the 2005A lease revenue bonds. And, okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you so much. Yay. <coughs> Okay, now we will be moving on to item number five. Uh, this is a consideration of resolution number 2015, uh, next in line, approving commitment of certain reserves for specified purposes consistent with the fund balance policy. And once again, Isaiah Hagerman, we're going to be handling this. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, annually, the Budget Subcommittee reviews the general fund reserves to determine if any changes are needed. Currently, the city has seven reserves that are set aside entitled Prudent Reserve, Disaster Recovery Reserve, Capital Projects Reserve, Economic Development Reserve, the Rich Spa Suites Reserve, Section 19 Water Reserve, and the Rancho Mirage Public Library Reserve. Based on the review, uh, we are requesting the change to two reserves out of the five, and we are requesting a reduction of four million in the disaster recovery reserve, and a reduction of 3.6 million in the economic development reserve. And the purpose for these reductions is to free up the city's funds, uh, anything that is not reserved, any fund balance, any funds uh, that the city has that are not reserved, they default into an unassigned category because they haven't been assigned anywhere. And due to the payment of uh, paying off the pension obligation to CalPERS, uh, that unassigned category uh, was reduced. And so this will free up unassigned fund balance based on the action that uh, was just passed to uh, pay off the 2005A lease revenue bonds after the 3.6 million needed for that. Um, if this is approved, we would have about 5 million remaining in the unassigned fund balance. And that's our cushion so that we don't have to come back and amend this policy uh, if something comes up in the future. So it's good to keep a little bit of balance that's unassigned uh, for those needs that arise. You don't have to immediately come back to city council and, and request uh, an edit to the reserves. So on page 5-2 of the staff report uh, is a table that summarizes our reserves. And the first column is when we originally adopted these reserves in May 2013. The middle column is where they're at currently. And then the third column off to the right is where it's gonna be after these requested changes. So as you can see, we're only requesting changes to two of the reserves. All other reserves will stay at the levels that they're at. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions or comments? Just one comment that uh, the reduction in these uh, two funds really doesn't uh, take the opportunity away of, of having more money in those funds in the future. We can always put money back into these reserve funds as they're needed. And in the case of the economic development reduction, it's not so much that we are going to limit what we're doing in economic development, but based on the current need for those funds and uh, as compared to some of the other areas, we've decided to move some of that money out of that fund. But if a few years from now we needed money for economic development, we can always move some monies from other funds back into this one. Richard, is, is there, just for my information, is there a limit or a, a ceiling that has to be in each of these funds at all times? No. Not? No, we, we can put it whatever amount we want in there. We don't have to put anything if we don't, but it just allows us to uh, give a, a, an image of balancing these funds out through various needs that the city has on a long-term basis. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, and thank you for the clarity on that because uh, looking at these funds with the disaster recovery in these three columns, it almost looks like, you know, if something did happen as an, in a disaster, uh, that we would not have the funds available, but as long as we can have those funds at any time that are necessary, they are yeah, there. Yeah. And that's, I think, very reassuring to everyone. Yeah, these are not fixed amounts. They're right. just what they are right now. Next year, we might want to come in and, and change them because of some other needs. Right. Good. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so would someone like to make a motion? All right, I'll make a motion to, um, to approve resolution number 2015 next in order, 
approving commitment of certain reserves for specified purposes consistent with the fund balance policy. Okay. I will second that. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. And now we're going to move on to item number six. And this will be handled by, uh, I believe, Kim Malcolm Valenti. She's our administrative services director and also perhaps Sarah Steepleton, who is our information services manager. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Members of the Council, I'd like to talk about the exciting world of mailing machines. What we're requesting today is that you approve the award of contract to priority mailing and then authorize the city manager to execute such contract. We are just now coming up on the end of a five-year term with our existing equipment. We did an RFP issued in December. Uh, staff reviewed the responses. We only received one and are now recommending that we renew for a five-year lease at approximately uh, $36,000 for the whole term. Sufficient funds have been budgeted and will be programmed in the future year's budgets as well. And we're here to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> Kim, did we do an RFP on this? Yes, we did. It was uh, it's attached in your staff report and it was posted on our website in December. Uh, responses were due in mid-January. Four companies downloaded and one responded, and that is who we're requesting that you award the contract to. Thank is this you. the same company that we always had? Yes, it is. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Nope. Any questions from the uh, public? Okay. Public questions now closed. Uh, would someone like to make a motion? I will make a motion that the City Council approve the award of contract to priority mailing and authorize the city manager to enter into a five-year lease agreement for mailing systems, equipment, and services in the amount of $35,645.52. And I will second. So we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you so much, Kim, and thank you all of, every, up here. It was a, another delightful day uh, on the council, and we hope that we'll see you next time at our next meeting, which is going to take place on March 19th, and we look forward to seeing you all then. Oh, we have to talk about Stephen. Yes, almost forgot. It's my turn. <laughs> Let Stephen, Stephen will talk about our closed oh, thank close you, session. Madam, thank you, Madam Mayor. The uh, City Council is now going to recess into closed session. Um, pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9 regarding the case of Veronica Juarez versus the City of Rancho Mirage. Council will also confer with legal counsel regarding two potential litigation items pursuant to 54956.9D4 of the Government Code. Council will also consider the public employee performance evaluation and, um, the, um, and, and confer with this labor negotiator regarding this compensation of both the city manager and city clerk pursuant to government code section 54957.6. Well, thank you so much. And now I believe we can adjourn. Okay, we're all done. Thank you so much. He's